Okay, the project that we have is a history of the tramvia, or actually the history of the Metro Manila mass transit system. We were provoked to do this because of the traffic problems in Manila and particularly the issues with the MRT and the LRT, overcrowding, continual breakdown. And so we wanted to do a history of this project. Actually, the whole project, which is part of the EIDR uh, projects, is uh, a four-phase project, uh, or a four-project four uh, program. Uh, which consists of a documentary, oral history, written history, uh, technical side of the LRT system. So it is a joint project, a uh, joint program with the Third World Studies Center and the uh, National Center for Transport Studies, Department of Geography, and also the Department of History and College of Engineering. So it's a multi, uh, it's a multi uh, disciplinal project and one of these is a document to produce a documentary that covers the mass transit system in Metro Manila from the beginning, 1883 to 2014 or thereabouts. So it basically tackles, uh, the documentary itself is in two parts and we've finished the first part. The first part, which will be shown a little later on, focuses on the period of the tramvia, tranvia or, or tramvia or the streetcar which was started in 1883 and was totally destroyed by 1945 when World War II ended. So that's our uh, project. And we wanted to show that in Metro Manila, there had been attempts to provide mass transit long before, and for a while it worked. The second part of the documentary series would cover the post-war uh, mass transit system, which would actually be from the 1970s up until 2014. That would be the LRT, the MRT, the different lines that were planned. And it was quite serendipitous that we found out that the plans of these rail, rail systems were all right here in UP. And so we, had, we, we launched this project. We finished the first part of the documentary, which is the Tranvia. The second part is still being uh, produced at this time. Okay, I think it's very significant because when you look at the trains today, the LRT, the MRT, the mass transit system today, it seems like it was very poorly planned. Uh, there have been issues with them in terms of uh, technical, technical capacities, problems. And when the tramvia was there, it seemed that it was functional, it was reliable, it was something that people could could really work, uh, could really depend on at the time. So insofar as trying to find a solution to today's problems, again, looking historically, looking back at the past, we could do it before. The plans were particularly good. What happened now? So it provides us with a perspective on why our system is failing today. One major problem that we had in making this documentary was we wanted to interview people who rode the tranvias before the war and they were very hard to find. Uh, we managed to find two or three who remembered the Tranvia, but by this time they were all in their 80s. That was one major problem. The second problem was that there's hardly anything existent today that is, rele uh, that is relevant to the Tranvia. There are no real street tracks. Uh, most of them were taken away. Uh, there is a life-size reconstruction of the Meralco Tranvia in the Meralco Museum, but other than that, there's very little physical structure left that can allow us to look into what remains of the tranvia system today. So those were two particular problems. Another one also was a shortage of moving pictures or, or documentary film that showed tranvias in the different periods of its history. There's no moving film that we found on the Spanish era tranvia, when the tranvia was still being pulled by horses. There is some, quite, some, quite a bit of moving pictures for the American period. Uh, I have not found any, any real pictures from the Japanese occupation, that moving pictures. Uh, so we have a, an imbalance. Uh, we also have, we still have not completed the maps uh, where the train used to run. Uh, it, it was, some, it was a, quite, with quite a bit of difficulty that we actually tried to find maps of the routes of the old Tranvia system. 
uh, in front of me is a model of, it's not in the Philippines, but this is a Tokyo tram. It's a Tokyo tram car. And the Philippine or the Manila uh, tram used, like, used to be like this, very similar to this. Next to it is an actual ticket of a Meralco tram car before the war. So this, uh, the, the relic that we have here is one of the very few items that we have physically left of the whole tramvia system. The popularity of trains in Japan is such that even things like the old streetcars, they have models of. Here, unfortunately, we don't have the same type of hobby enthusiasts who would uh, support a uh, production of models of this sort. We have several still photographs. I brought quite a number of them with me. We used some of them in the documentary. Among the pictures that we have, uh, that I brought here today, would be pictures showing the Tranvia in Metro Manila, in Manila in particular, in front of uh, the post office building, different stages of the Tranvia during the American period. Uh, one picture is interesting because it shows an accident, uh, two Tranvias having collided with each other. So even at that time, you already had some issues with safety, but most of the time they investigated it and tried to work on it. I, we also, I also brought a picture of a flood in Manila to show that floods in Manila and the disruption of traffic due to floods is not something that we just face today, but has been there for a hundred years. This is a picture of the um, Meralco Tramvia. That's why it's called Meralco because it's Manila Electric Railroad and light company. This is a uh, tramvia in the 1920s. This was in Escolta. This picture was taken in Escolta. It's open-sided, and as you can see, its rivals were the Calesa. Later on, more automobiles will become its rival. This picture shows floods in Manila before the war. This is probably early 1930s, and so again, flooding of the main streets in Manila was an issue at the time. The Tranvia, of course, would suspend operation when the streets became very badly flooded. This is a picture of a Tranvia rounding the curve in Rosario Street. Uh, there were several spots in Manila that were excellent places to take photos of the Tranvia. One was in Escolta, one was in Plaza Goiti, and the other one was the front of the post office building. So there are several pictures of the tranvias that we have here. Here again, you see the traffic is pretty light. Uh, this is probably the 1920s. Uh, the Calesas are there, no automobiles yet. This is an interesting picture showing two tranvias apparently having collided uh, at one point or having collided with the Calesa that you see there. So this is a picture of an accident that would occur uh, there were many accidents that were reported. Some of them were collisions with vehicles. Sometimes passengers would get bumped because the rails were right on street level and uh, the waiting areas were right next to the tranvia itself. So uh, there were a number of accidents reported. And this is one picture showing that. Okay, one photo here shows the tranvia in the Escolta area around 1920. Again, the major, uh, the other vehicles are basically Calesas. A few cars are now, in, in, uh, are now visible, but most of them are still Calesas. The other photograph shows the waiting shed of the Tranvia in front of Plaza Goiti, which is right next to Santa Cruz Church. Uh, this is where several lines converged, and uh, the plaza is still there, but nothing remains of the tracks or the waiting shed. This is a colorized picture of uh, a tranvia in the Escolta area. Uh, this is before the war, sometime probably in the 1930s. Again, you see the calesas. What's interesting here that, is that since the color was done at the time, we see the accurate colors of that period rather than reconstructions from long after. So the Meralco streetcars were red, basically. And even the reconstructed streetcar in the Meralco Museum is also red. Another photograph of the intersection of the different lines and the waiting shed in Plaza Goiti. Uh, on the right side is Santa Cruz Church. On the left side is what used to be Prudential Bank. Uh, but that, uh, both buildings are still there in uh, the Santa Cruz area of Manila. A ground level shot of a station 
uh, I think this this is also in uh, Plaza Goiti, and you have a tranvia here. So you'd see how people really intermingled with the tranvia, and how closely they were related to the tranvia. The rails were again street level, and so we have the tranvia becoming very much a part of the Manila street scene. It's another view of Santa Cruz Church and the traffic that was going around it. Uh, the Calesas, people walking all over. Uh, the tranvia lines were would converge in this area. Still another picture of the Santa Cruz area. Again, it's Santa Cruz Church on one side. This is again Plaza Goiti, where the lines converge. This is a still from a moving picture showing Escolta. Now we see the traffic here. Uh, there is a car, there are several cars, and you have the people. There is a policeman also visible in the picture. This is one of the other favorite viewpoints to view the Tranvia. This is taken from the post office building. And uh, you see that, again, the lines would come, would converge from Jones Bridge, from Santa Cruz, and go down towards the Taft area, uh, moving south. So at this time, uh, the city hall was still under construction, but this was a favorite spot to view this part of Manila. You'll notice all the greenery, and you'll also see that we can date this to the 1930s because of the cars, the type of cars that you now see. So this is uh, mid to late 1930s. Uh, this is Jones Bridge. It shows a tranvia crossing the Repasig River alongside many cars. The interesting thing to note here is that the cars were driving on the left, which was the uh, style at the time. But the tranvia would face competition with the cars and also the people and the calesas. So this is a classic photograph showing the tranvia crossing the Pasig, moving from north to south. This is a 1932 map of the tranvia system. It's uh, put, published by the Manila Electric Company, or Meralco. By this time, they had uh, it was basically light, but they still had the, they were still using the tranvias. So we'd see the interconnections of the different lines. You could transfer to different lines at different stations. And it covered most of central Manila, went as far out as uh, Fort Bonifacio, which was Fort McKinley at the time. And at one point during the Spanish period, it even went up to Malabon, and there was a, it uh, went up to Antipolo. Uh, the Americans cut those lines because they were no longer viable, but uh, this shows how very convenient the tranvia lines were before the war. This is the life-size reconstruction of a pre-war tranvia in the Meralco Museum in Ortigas Avenue. So looking at pictures and what plans they had, they rebuilt one in the exact style of the pre-war tranvia. We see here it's going from San Marcelino to Pasay, partly to offset the losses uh, that it would, and to add to its profits, it carried several, several uh, advertisements, as we can see here, cigars, uh, drinks, even movies and other shows. This is the inside, the interior of the Meralco uh, reconstructed life-size tramvia. This is one type of tranvia with the seats being uh, side by side like this. Another tranvia style had the seats running lengthwise and you'd have them fake passengers facing each other. This other picture shows very clearly that it's a Meralco uh, tranvia, Malian Electric Company, and uh, this is the exterior showing the original color that they had before the war. During the war, the Japanese used the tranvia also for propaganda purposes. This is a rare photograph of a Japanese soldier of the propaganda corps posting messages and posting propaganda inside the tranvia. The streetcar conductor is looking on curiously, uh, and there are some passengers on board. Okay, so during the Japanese occupation, the Japanese Taiwan Electric Company took over from Meralco, since Meralco was an American company. Uh, they were not able to provide spare parts or uh, maintain the cars properly since the, American, since the Americans had built the streetcars. 
And so one problem during the Japanese occupation was that the number of streetcars dwindled, and as they dwindled in number, they became harder and harder to find. This is a classic photograph showing how overcrowded the tranvias became late in the war. Finally, the Japanese commandeered them all and used them for military purposes. None of them survived. But if we think of the rush hour in the MRT and the LRT as being bad, we can see how conditions during the Japanese times were even worse. I think it's, I think it, 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 it's a very, it, it's, a, it's a deepening experience to watch this documentary because we realize that uh, not everything was this bad in Manila before. And while the mass transit system that we have today has its issues, there were attempts to solve the mass transit system a long time ago. Of course, the population was much smaller than it is today, but it was a kind of uh, proactive movement by the government to try to provide solutions to mass transit, uh, moving from horse-drawn streetcars to electric-run streetcars, moving away from simply the calesas and the caratelas onto a more systematic mode of transportation. This is one thing that we wanted to show. And we hope that it actually will be able to encourage people to realize that we had things that worked in the past. And if we were able to have these plans work in the past, why can't we do it today? So again, as a historian, it's something that we learned from the past. It shows also, it, it gives us a bit more breadth and depth to understanding the present problems. It's not just today that we had issues with moving people, but a hundred years ago we already had those problems of how to move people systematically around the city. Their solutions then would provide us with lessons for planning today. Uh, one thing with history that many people are turned away uh, is, is that when it's taught in high school and when it's taught in the earlier years, the, fo the focus tends to be on dates, of dates, names of people, names of places. That turns many people off because we don't see that there is a deeper sense to history than just that. You also have why things happened, what caused things happened, interrelations, how uh, one thing led to another. Studying this actually makes history alive because you see some of the principles still there today. And one thing that characterized Philippine history for a long time is that it focused essentially on political history, maybe a little bit of social history and economic history, but mostly politics. There are different sides of Philippine history that have not fully been raised yet. One of them is history of transportation, which is what we try to address here. There is also the history of uh, the ordinary people. Most of the histories that we know focus on the big people, the uh, elite. So who were the people, for example, who actually drove the tranvias? Who were those who rode the tranvias? Which is why in this documentary we tried to give a voice to the riding public, because they too are very frequently forgotten in doing histories. So it's not just the management determining where the lines would run, how it operated, how much the tickets would cost, also the riding public, the drivers, the conductors, they have their own perspective and we should try to bring this out. It, it's this that is making history very dynamic today because we're no longer focusing just on the big people, the big picture, but we're looking at the ordinary people, how, this, how history affected their lives and trying to give them a voice uh, instead of keeping them muted. Well, in, in a sense, we were amateurs uh, in, in making this documentary. Uh, it, we have had an experience in documentary making with Canadian students working with Filipino students, but this was the first time that we were really trying to do it on our own. So we had to we quickly learn how to write the script. Uh, we had people doing work in the field since we were covering the 1970s up to the 20. Uh, up to fairly recently, the LRT and the MRT, we had photographers go there to do the shoot there. So uh, this would, this is a very, very vibrant thing. Working together with the Department of Geography, 
we also were able to animate a few maps. And we hope to do that, especially with the second part of the documentary, to show how the lines expanded. So we were trying to use animation, we used oral history, we interviewed people, we interviewed authorities on the subject. So it's a really, a, it, it's a documentary, but not a documentary perhaps in the old style. We tried to make it a little more active. If we had more money, we would have tried to put in a little more animation, but we were quite limited with our resources. But uh, it was a learning process for us on how to keep the, how to keep the script manageable. We had a couple of experts coming in uh, who had been worked with us before in other documentaries who told us more or less how to focus the script properly because with all the footage that we had, it was sometimes hard to keep it together. How to keep it within a specific time frame. This was especially difficult because if you had no time limit, then you could make a documentary that was very long. And we had a lot of good interviews, we had a lot of good footage. But trying to keep it within a strict time limit and not go beyond that was a major problem that we had. But I think we managed to do, uh, get that done. Also, whether we use a narrator or not, or let the uh, pictures speak for themselves, we eventually had to use a narrator, but we tried to limit it as uh, short as possible. Well, uh, again, this is the first part of a two-part documentary. So the first part we, fe we feel was quite successful in bringing the message of early mass transit in Metro Manila. So wait for the second part. We hope to have that finished later this year. And I hope you'll enjoy the show and take something back with you that some things worked before and that we did think about how to move people around Metro Manila long ago, not just fairly recently. Dito sa Kamaynilaan, araw-araw, milyon-milyon ang sumasagupa sa init, usok, ulan, at pagsisiksikan sa mga sasakyang di na halos makagalaw sa mga nagsisikip na daan, makarating lang sa kanilang pupuntahan. Kung may tinitingnan mang alternatibo sa miserabling kalagayang ito, ito ang mga sasakyang nasa riles, ang MRT, ang LRT, ang PNR. Ipinangangako ng mga ito ang isang mass transit na mabilis at nasa oras at nakapagsasakay ng pinakamaraming pasahero. Pero kung lilingunin natin ang nakaraan ng mga riles sa kamay nilaan, paminsan-minsan lang natutupad ang pangakong ito. Ang kasaysayan ng tren at tranvia sa kamay nilaan ay kwento ng mga diskarteng na diskaril at ng mga planong pinursige. Noong 1880, dalawang daang libo pa lang ang tao sa Maynila. Ang kabahayan ay hindi pa lumalagpas sa Tondo, Malate, San Palok at San Miguel. Sentro ng gobyerno ang Intramuros. Sentro naman ng komersyo ang Binondo. Ang buhay at komersyo ay dumadaloy sa ilog at mga estero. Ang nagmamadali ay umaasa sa tulin ng kalabaw at kabayo. Pero maraming magbabago sa dulo ng ikalabinsiyam na siglo. Kasabay sa bumilis na daloy ng tao ang bugso ng teknolohiya at puhunan. Sa gobyerno ng kolonyang laging kapos sa pera, nakatulong ang mga negosyanteng namuhunan sa serbisyong panlipunan. Sa panahong ito, nagsisimula pa lang ang modernong Maynila. Inaayos ang sewerage, Ikinakabit ang mga gripo, itinatayo ang mga linya ng telegraph, sinisimulang gamitin ang kuryente, at sa transportasyon, unang gagamitin ang riles. 1883 nang unang magkaroon ng riles sa Maynila, pero ang riles na ito ay hindi pa para sa tren, 
kundi para sa tranvia. Naitatag ang tranvia sa Pilipinas sa pamamagitan ng dalawang petisyon. Ang unang petisyon ay uh, sinimula ni Don Leon Monsur, isang residente ng Madrid. Nagplano siya ng uh, limang linya ng tranvia, ang Malacanang, Malate, Intramuros, Sampaloc at Tondo, ngunit hindi napatupad ang plano. Ang pangalawang petisyon ay nanggaling kina Don Jacobo Zobel I. Sangrunis at Don Luciano Bremon. Nabigyan sila ng eksklusibong konsesyon para magtatag ng tranvia at ito ay kinilala bilang Kompanya de las Tranvias de Filipinas. December 1883, nang unang tumakbo sa pagitan ng Tondo at Binondo ang mga tranvia de sangre, may bisa sa loob ng anim na pung taon ang prangkisang ipinagkaloob sa kanila ng Hari ng Espanya. Limang linya ang binuksan ng Kompanya de las Tranvias de Filipinas, kabilang ang mga lugar na Malabon, Malate, Intramuros, Sampaloc at Tondo. Ang sentrong estasyon ay nasa Plaza San Gabriel o ang ngayon ay Plaza Cervantes sa Binondo. Napalilibutan noon ang Plaza Cervantes ng mga bangko at ng mga trading houses na Ingles, Aleman at Amerikano. Nasa Binondo rin ang mga tindahang Chino. Dadalhin ng tranvia ang mga empleyado, trabahador at mamimili papunta at paalis sa sentro ng komersyo. Ang tranvia ay pinapatakbo ng labing anim hanggang dalawampung kabayo at ito ay hinihila sa pamamagitan ng riles. Ito ay tumatakbo ng dalawampung kilometro kada oras at uh, nagsisimulang operasyon alas sais ng umaga hanggang alas otso ng gabi. May tranvia de sangre at may tranvia de vapor. Ang sangre o dugo ay tumutukoy sa dugo at laman ng mga kabayong humihila sa mga tranvia. May tranvia rin gumagamit ng steam engine. Labing dalawa hanggang labing walong pasahero lamang ang laman ng karaniwang bagon ng tranvia. Nang tumagal, umaabot ito minsan ng tatlumpong pasahero. Pampasahero lamang ang mga tranvia, hindi para sa mga kargamento at hindi rin ito para sa malayo ang biyahe. 1888 nang unang lumabas sa sentro ng Maynila ang mga riles ng tranvia. Inasahang ang linya pamalabon ang magdadala sa Maynila ng mga ani at huli na di lamang galing sa Malabon kundi sa mga probinsya rin ng Bulacan at Pampanga. Pinuntirya rin ng Kompanya de Tranvias ang negosyong dala ng planta ng asukal sa Malabon at ng mga pabrika nito ng tabako. Habang itinatayo ang mga linya ng tranvia sa Maynila at Malabon, ginagawa na rin ang riles para sa tren na tatakbo mula Maynila hanggang Northern Luzon. 1892 nang magsimulang bumiyahe ang tren mula tutuban padagupan. Gaya ng Kompanya de Tranvias, ang Manila Railway Company ay may konsesyon din mula sa hari ng Espanya na eksklusibong magmay-ari at magpatakbo ng tren ng halos isang daang taon. Isang pribadong kompanyang Ingles ang Manila Railway Company. Inasahan itong kumita sa pagdala ng mga pasahero galing at pabalik sa mga bayan sa Central at Northern Luzon. Pero higit pa sa pasahero, mas inasahan nito ang kita mula sa kargamento ng asukal at bigas papasok sa Maynila. Pero nagkaroon ng mga problema ang operasyon ng tranvia. Isa na rito ang pagbaha sa Maynila na nagreresulta sa suspensyon ng operasyon ng tranvia para hindi madiskaril ang mga bagon. Ang isa pang problema sa tranvia ay ang pagkakasakit ng mga kabayo. Habang pinag-uugnay ng riles ang mga distrito ng Maynila at ang Maynila ay ikinakabit naman nito sa gitna ng Hilagang Luzon, Papalapit naman ng papalapit ang kolonya sa isang revolusyon. 
Agosto 1896 nang sumiklab ang Himagsikan. Karamihan sa mga labanan ay nangyari sa paligid lamang ng Maynila at sa mga katabing probinsya nito, gaya ng Cavite, Batangas at Bulacan. Hindi nagalaw ang mga tranvia sa Maynila, pero ang mga kabayong kailangan para patakbuhin nito, mas kinailangan sa digmaan. Nakapagdeklara ng kalayaan ang mga revolusyonaryong Filipino noong Hunyo 1898. Sa puntong ito ng revolusyon, papasok ang mga Amerikano bilang bagong mananakop. Disyembre 1898, nang lagdaan ng Espanya at Amerika ang Treaty of Paris, kasama sa mga napagkasunduan ang pagbenta ng Espanya sa Pilipinas sa halagang 20 milyong dolyar. Naetsya puwera ang mga revolusyonaryong Filipino. Alam natin na ang pananakop ng Pilipinas ay suportado ng mga negosyante sa Estados Unidos. Kaya't mahalaga na mabigyan ng pagkakataon ang mga negosyo ng mga Amerikano na pumasok sa Pilipinas. At isa ang sektor ng transportasyon at ang mga serbisyong panlipunan sa mga maaring pasukan ng mga negosyanteng Amerikano. Bago mag-1903, nagsimulang mag-usap ang Compañía de Tranvías at isang grupo ng mga negosyanteng Amerikano na pinangunahan ni Charles Swift. Binili ni Swift ang Compañía de Tranvías, ang prangkisa nito, at ang lahat ng ari-ari ang kakabit ng operasyon. Now when Miracle came in, they also got the electrical franchise which was just starting and they combined the electrical franchise with the transportation and that gave rise to the uh, electric streetcar sa pinagsanib na prangkisa ng Tranvia at Kuryente na buo ni na Swift ang Manila Electric Railroad and Light Company o Meralco isang pangalang kilala ng mga Pilipino hanggang ngayon Yeah, dahil uh, meron na silang karanasan eh. Sa mga lungsod sa Amerika, sa New York, sa Boston, maraming mga tramvia doon, hindi sa kanila unique yung uh, teknolohiya. Pero noong tinayo ang Meralco, noong 1903, yun, nung simula ang construction nito, hanggang sa ito ay formal lang pinasinayaan noong 1905. Walang ganoong klasing teknolohiya na gumagamit ng kuryente para sa transportasyon. Nangangamba itong mga Amerikano, kaya ba nilang gawin? At yung mga Pilipino naman ay nagpakitang gilas. Nakakuha ng limampung taong prangkisa ang Meralco mula sa gobyerno. April 10, 1905, nang unang tumakbo ang mga dekuryenteng tranvia. Isang importanteng uh, araw ito dahil uh, sa kanilang pakiwari nung pagdating nila dito noong 1898, Uh, hanggang noong 19, 1905, pakiramdam nila walang maayos na sistema ng transportasyon. Kasi naabutan nila yung uh, trambia na galing sa panahon ng mga Kastila na hinihila ng mga kabayo. Noong 1906, nagbuo pa si na Swift ng isa pang kompanya, ang Manila Suburban Railway Company. Sapagkat nagkaroon ng bagong prangkisa, ang paglawak ng uh, sistema ng mga riles no? at nagtayo ng bagong istasyon sa Paco na dapat tutuloy sa tinatawag lang Fort McKinley. So, dalawa ang naging uh, organisasyon na ginagamit ng mga Amerikano. Nandun yung Meralco at nandun din yung Manila Suburban Railway Company. Ang mga managers ay kinukuha nila sila ay mga Ingles at sila ay mga Amerikano. Subalit sa baba, nandoon doon ang mga Pilipino at nagkaroon ng pagkakataon ang mga Pilipino na magkaroon ng hanap buhay bilang tagagawa ng mga bagon, bilang tagagawa ng mga riles at dumami ang mga Pilipino dito. At umabot ang mga linya sa mga lugar na dati hindi nararating ng tranvia. Nagkaroon na ng biyahe ng tranviyang dekuryente papuntang Pasay, San Juan, Makati, Pasig, at kahit hanggang bahagi ng tagig, ang tranvia de vapor, pamalabon, naging dekuryente na rin. Ang paglawak na ito ng mga kompanya ni Swift 
ay sinabayan pa ng pagpapalawak rin ng mga linya ng dating Manila Railroad Company na sa panahong ito ay kontrolado na rin ng mga Amerikano. Ang Taytay Antipolo Line binuksan sa publiko noong 1905, ang Marikina Line noong 1906. Mula 1908 hanggang 1915, naikabit naman sa tutuban ang linya ng tren na papuntang Paco at mula sa Paco hanggang Muntinlupa. Pahagi ito noon ng pag-develop ng Manila Railroad Company sa kanyang main line south na papuntang Cavite, Batangas, Laguna, Quezon hanggang Kabikulan. Isang dekada matapos ang digma ang Filipino-Amerikano na ilatag sa kamay nilaan ang pinakamalawak nitong network ng mga riles para sa tren at tranvia. Hanggang ngayon, hindi pa ito natatapatan. Pero hindi simpleng public service ito ng mga Amerikano. Namumuhunan sila at umaasa sa tubo at laging umiiwas sa lugi. Pagdating ng 1920s, may kalahating milyon na ang populasyon ng Kamaynilaan. Dahil sentro ng komersyo, pangunahing dahilan ng pagdami ng populasyon nito ang dumarayong mga manggagawa galing sa mga probinsya. Noong 1906, umabot sa 10 milyon ang pasahero sa mga tranvia ng Meralco. Pagdating ng 1925, tatlumput limang milyong pasahero ang sumakay sa tranvia, patunay lamang sa paulit-ulit at malawakang paggamit dito. Pwede kong masabi na niyakap talaga ng husto ng mga Pilipino, maging yung mga Chino na nagtatrabaho sa Maynila, ginawa nilang importanteng bahagi ng kanilang buhay kasi makikita naman yan doon sa dami ng mga taong sumasakay. Pag binilang mo yung dami ng mga pasahero sa isang taon, umaabot ng milyon yung kanilang mga pasahero ng Meralco. Litaw rin yan doon sa pagsisiksikan nga ng mga tao. Yun ay manifestasyon noong popularidad ng Meralco sa mga ordinaryong tao. I remember it as a one-unit car. Eh. May... May seating ang around sa, sa window. In the middle, merong railing na parang pwede kang humawak. So, when the trambia is full, and most of the time it is, people have to stand holding on to the rail. Hindi masyadong mataas yung trambia. Siguro mga equivalent to mga two steps from the ground. Pero hindi nagtagal ang operasyon ng tranvia. Maraming nangyari sa politika na nagkaroon ng epekto dito. 1907, nang iboto ng mga Pilipino ang mga kinatawan sa Philippine Assembly. 1916 naman, nang matatag ang Senado at Kongreso. At 1935, nang magsimula ang Commonwealth. At sa ikasampung taon nito, Ipagkakaloob na ng Estados Unidos ang kalayaan sa Pilipinas. Mawawala na ang mga mananakop at magsasarili na ang mga Pilipino. Nung maging gobernador general si Francis Burton Harrison, ang kanyang programa ay Pilipinisasyon na isasalin ang mga pwesto sa pamahalaan sa kamay ng mga Pilipino. Hindi ito magandang signos para sa mga negosyante na unti-unti nakikita nila na ang mga negosyo sa Pilipinas ay masasalin din sa kamay ng mga Pilipino. Nangamba ang mga negosyanteng Amerikano sa direksyon ng politika sa bansa. Nang maitayo ang Senado at Kongreso noong 1916, ibinenta nila sa gobyerno ang Manila Railroad Company. Hanggang ngayon, hawak ito ng gobyerno, ang Philippine National Railways. Nang sumunod na taon, itinigil ng gobyerno ang biyahe nito sa Taytay at Antipolo dahil sa kaunting kita. Ito ang naging simula ng pag-iksi ng mga riles na sumeserbisyo sa Kamaynilaan. Mas pinili ng gobyernong bigyang prioridad ang mga malayo ang biyahe ng tren. Binaklas ang ilang riles ng linyang Maynila hanggang Antipolo 
upang maging bahagi ng linyang Maynila hanggang Bicol. Noong 1922, iminungkahi ni Governor General Leonard Wood na kontrolin ng korporasyon ng negosyanteng Amerikano na si J.G. White ang Manila Railroad Company. Kasama ni Swift si White sa Meralco, umalma ang publiko at hindi ito natuloy. Ayaw daw ng mga mamamayan na maging katulad ng Meralco ang Manila Railroad Company. Kaya noong 1920, si Charles Sweet mismo na siyang CEO ng Meralco ay nag-alok sa pamahalaan na bilhin na ang Meralco. No? Uh, subalit, hindi kumilos ang pamahalaan dito sa offer na ito ni uh, Charles Sweet. Sa tingin ko, ang pag-aagam-agam ni Charles Sweet ay nanggagaling sa politika. No? na maaring dumating ang panahon na sasabihin ng gobyerno na ang sektor ng transportasyon at komunikasyon ay dapat sumailalim sa gobyerno. Noong 1925, kapwa mga Amerikanong negosyante ang bumili ng Meralco kay Swift, ang kompanyang Associated Gas and Electric Company, na natiling Meralco ang pangalan ng kompanya. Habang nangyayari ito, Bumabagsak ang ekonomiya ng Amerika nang magka-Great Depression sa Estados Unidos noong 1930s, halos matuyo ang kinikitang buwis ng gobyerno sa pag-export ng cash crops. Bawas na buwis, bawas na panustos sa mga gawain ng gobyerno, partikular na sa operasyon ng mga korporasyong pag-aari nito gaya ng Manila Railroad Company. Noong 1936, itinigil nito ang Marikina Line. Pero ang naging pinakamalaking banta sa mass transit noon ay ang mass production ng mga kotse at bus. Suddenly, the railroad came and then very shortly after that, the internal combustion of the automobile, the road system. So again, there was a drastic change. Uh, this had economic consequences. They brought in the automobiles and started building roads for them. Makikita natin na ang sistema ng transportasyon ay naapektuhan ng kasaysayan ng teknolohiya. At dito sa mga panahon na ito, lumalawak yung car industry at ang mga kotse ay ang mga bagong sistema ng pag-ikot sa iba't ibang lugar. Ganon din naman pagdating ng mga kotse, ng mga sasakyan, nagkaroon ka ng mga taxi, nagkaroon ka ng mga livery garages. Bagamat iba rin yung uh, clientele, maglilipatan din. Yung mga merong sapat na pera na kumuha ng taxi, may sapat na pera para sa livery garage, o sapat na pera para bumili ng kanilang sariling sasakyan, nangangahulugan na ito ay kabawasan doon sa pangkalahatang dami ng pasahero ng Meralco. Ang ibang nagsulputang mga kumpanya dyan, mayroon tinatawag na Pasay Transportation Company na gustong magbigay ng operasyon sa bandang timog ng kamay nilaan na direktang makikipagkumpetisyon doon sa linya ng Meralco sa Ermita, Malate, Paco area. Sa simula nga, ang sinubukang gawin taktika ng Meralco ay daanin sa legal. Ang ibig ko sabihin, eh, gamitin yung kanilang lakas. Yung kanilang impluensya sa pamahalaan, sinampahan ng kaso sa uh, gobyerno na kesyo ito daw ay uh, lumalabag doon sa prangkisa na ibinigay ng gobyerno sa Meralco. Kaya dapat uh, tanggalin yung lisensya ng uh, Pasay Transport Company na mag-operate. Pero hindi ito uh, napagbigyan. Sinubukang panatilihin ng Meralco ang kanilang monopolyo sa mass transit sa loob ng Maynila. Ang Meralco ay nakasabay din kahit papaano. Katunayan nga, pagpasok ng dekadang iyon, 1920s, unti-unti nang magpapasok sa kanilang transportation fleet ng mga bus itong Meralco. Unti-unti, naging mas mababa yung proportion ng tranvia passengers kumpara doon sa overall passengers ng Meralco. Unti-unting kumakain sa proportion na yon yung mga taong sumasakay sa bus ng Meralco. Paniwala ng Meralco na ang kanilang mga karibal ay nagtatayo lamang ng mga kompanya ng bus para mapilitan silang i-buy out ang mga ito. 
Ngunit pagpasok ng 1930s, nandun pa rin ang mga kompanya ng bus na karibal ng Meralco. Isa na rito ang Halili Transit na itinayo ng Filipinong si Fortunato Halili. Hinikayat ng Halili ang mga pasahero gamit ang mga linyang nagsasabi na tangkilikin ninyo ang puhunang Pilipino at pangakong ang kanilang mga otokalesay pinalalakad ng mga maiingat at magalang na tsuper. Liban sa kompetisyon, marami ring naging problema ang tranvia ng Meralco. May mga naaaksidente, nababangga at nakakaladkad. Minsan naman, nakakasalpukan ng tranvia ang iba pang mga sasakyan. Noong 1920s, dumami na ang populasyon ng Maynila at maaring hindi na sapat ang serbisyo na ibinibigay ng sistema ng transportasyon. Kaya maraming naging mga reklamo tungkol dito. Unang-una, walang sapat na upuan. Tapos, mayroon din mga reklamo tungkol sa bayad na dapat magkaroon ng regulasyon tungkol sa ibinabayad ng mga sumasakay na ito ay hindi dapat masyadong mahal. Ilang beses ding nagwelga ang mga trabahador ng tranvia ng Meralco, kadalasan dahil sa baba ng sweldo. Noong Mayo 1919, naparalisa ang Maynila dahil sa kanilang strike. Nang sumunod na buwan, Nagpasabog ng bomba sa Plaza Goiti ang isa sa mga trabahador ng tranvia. Gayunman, hindi maipagkakaila ang silbi ng tranvia sa kamay nilaan. This is the Philippines, December 26, 1941, the day after Christmas. Jack bombers are coming. They're coming in spite of the fact that Manila was declared an open city to spare it from destruction. Nang sumiklab ang World War II, pinilit pang patakbuhin ng mga mananakop na Hapon ang tranvia. And uh, it was very convenient at first. But as the war bro- uh, went on and uh, the cars broke down, there were less and less street cars and more and more riders. It was very, very crowded. Not only that, since the streetcars have been taken over by the Taiwan then Ryoku Kaisha, the Taiwan Electric uh, uh, Company, people felt it was enemy property and they tried not to pay. Puslit. So puslit became a very common thing. During the big typhoon of 1943, nothing was running. And afterwards, they resumed running over very pockmarked streets. Because there was no road maintenance. But all I remember is they were there, they were diminishing in number and in comfort, and eventually the Japanese just took them to the Luneta and lined them up as tank barriers. Pero noong patapos na ang giyera, sa bakbakang naganap sa kamay nilaan sa pagitan ng mga Hapon at ng pinagsanib na puwersang Filipino at Amerikano, Tuluyan ang nasunog at naabo ang mga tranvia. Sa durog na kamay nilaan, sa mga kali nitong inuka ng bomba, sisimulang mamamasada ang kalaunan magiging hari ng kalsada at simbolo ng di gumagalaw na traffic, ang jeep. Matapos ang giyera at matapos matatag ang ikatlong republika, Parang nakalimutan na ang transportasyon sa riles sa loob ng kalunsuran. Sa panahong iyon, malayong alaala na ang mga tranvia de sangre at de vapor. Ang Meralco Streetcars, ang mga tren na biyahing Marikina at Antipolo. Ang mga riles nila ay naging bakat na lamang sa daan, natatabuna ng semento at aspalto sa halos walang tigil na kakakonkreto ng mga kalsada para sa paparami at paparaming mga sasakyan. People miss a reliable mode of transportation and I think they still do. 
has no centralized mode was uh, was introduced. It became jeepneys, which were kind of uh, individualistic units who ran where they wanted to. I wish uh, they kept the trambia, parang very clean and very efficient. Na itayo ang tranvia at tren sa kamay nila ang dahil may sumasakay, may nagpopondo at may kumikita. Dayuhan ang mga namuhunan, dayuhan ang kumita, mga Filipino ang sumakay. Kapag may problemang dala ng politika o pagbabago sa teknolohiya, ang unang nasa isip ng mga dayuhang namuhunan ay ang maiwasan ang pagkalugi at hindi kung paano maipagpapatuloy ang serbisyo sa publiko.